we've got this discussion that we're going to go into um, now about the um, about the general secretary's guidance. Um, now, we, I invited the general secretary to come on to the show to clarify exactly what it is that is safe to talk about and what you know, just to be really open about it. And and the problem is he keeps sending emails every 10 days or so with a, a new update on what's safe. And it would be much easier if you just get it all out and then we can get on with it. Um, but I've got a kind of a, a, a standard, I'm afraid he's, he's um, otherwise occupied um, on Sunday morning from half 10 to half 11. He's probably having a good breakfast. But um, what, what I... What I wanted to read out was actually the, the letter that he sent, um, the last one, uh, in which he says, um, I can understand, this is, this is uh, the uh, second paragraph, it was sent to all officers in the party. I can understand the desire of people to discuss contentious and controversial issues that they feel deeply about. But to be clear, the Labour Party was found guilty of breaking the law on anti-Semitism, we are now trusted to run our own affairs until we satisfy the EHRC that we have fully addressed the issues that meant our party is not a safe space for Jewish members. Just as we should not, we should have zero tolerance for all forms of racism, homophobia, sexual harassment, and other prejudicial behavior. Our responsibility to double down on anything that may cause members to continue to feel unwelcome and unsafe must take precedent precedence over our rights at this time. I um, I was really flabbergasted that he could talk about how something could take precedence over our rights, that he could make that point, um, especially when he'd mentioned the e EHRC as part of that. So I wrote an email to the EHRC to ask them if they thought this was an appropriate response to their report. Um, but I got a similar kind of email back saying um, uh, we will let you know what happens with the report. And it, didn't, it was a standard response. It was a it was triggered by some. And <laughs> I don't know what it was. But anyway, the general secretary has not come on this show. Um, we don't really know where we are. We're being asked to double, you know, to 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 not speak up for our rights at meetings. Um, Momentum's put forward an idea that we elect a general secretary um, next time. Um, is that something that that you that you agree with, Shanali? So we at our most recent NCG meeting, that's like the National Coordinating Group, where we all get together. So that's um, uh, twenty uh, regional reps plus all of our affiliates um, who range from like CPLD to uh, the FBU to so um, a lot of uh, other movements on the left. Um, we had a full discussion about a proposal to support the election of the GS in principle. Um, and that had overwhelming support. Um, I think it's um, I think it's a I think it's a discussion that long needs to be, you know, that's long overdue within our movement. I think it's really vital that this starts a movement-wide discussion about internal democracy. Because I think you're right, I think you're right, Crispin. And I do I really do appreciate you like inviting David Evans onto the show and for chasing that up. I think that's really you know, we need, you know, how, how can we hold the General Secretary to account? That is the key fundamental issue here. Um, but actually, the lack of internal democracy for the Labour Party has ramifications for democracy in the country as a whole. So it's actually really urgent and actually it's our responsibility in lots of ways as the Labour movement to address this. Um, on an internal level, fact, this factional clampdown has been incredibly divisive. It's been quite naked actually in its pursuit of um, sort of left members, people who support the transformative agenda that was fostered under Corbyn. Um, and on a really nuts and bolts level, divided parties don't win elections. And we're already seeing Starmer's approval ratings going down as a result. So even in terms of like the, the right wing's agenda, it's not very effective. Uh, we've gone from having members turning out for the one of the biggest if, the, if not the biggest um, electoral ground campaigns uh, the country's ever seen to a party where the, which is really happy to stop members from even having sort of basic discussion um you know our democratic rights as you pointed out christmas have been being suppressed so that is not that is not the way to treat people who have volunteered so much time and energy and dedication to make the country a better place 
for completely noble altruistic reasons because we are fed up with the way that this you know with the way that the injustice and the and the social inequality is ramping up in this country so it's you know so the general secretary is extremely powerful role um and he's completely unaccountable to the membership now we're not saying momentum that this is some sort of panacea we're saying that this should be the start of a broader discussion about internal democracy that could include other sort of like the nuances of that the, the the detail of that we think should be discussed by the movement and um, starting with momentum's membership but also the broader movement you know the unions um you know other left sort of groups in the movement um you know so for instance we also think that there should be you know we, we could discuss the idea of an increase in clp members reps on the nec for instance like you know what the members you know why is, why do the membership only have nine reps on the nec for instance there's other things um that connected to this discussion yeah and um you know we know from you know we know from the labor leaks and from more recent months that having a general secretary whose politics do not align with the leadership with the deputy leader and the leader well the, the leadership i should say that the membership support is catastrophic you know we saw you know we saw with, with mcnichol that that lack of alignment makes a, a party you know it makes it very difficult to even function let alone fulfill an agenda which the all the forces of the elite in this country are going to be sort of like trying to prevent happening um so i would say i feel really strongly that when you put together the allegations in the labor leaks the suppression of discussion about the labor leaks members suspensions including many jewish socialists being suspended just in the past few days prominent jewish socialists being suspended a clamp down on members speech rowing back on policy positions decided democratically at conference um that that all builds up not to a worrying indication that internal democracy is being suppressed but actually suggests to me that democracy in this country is being undermined by a faction within the Labour Party. If we're not allowed to have a socialist leader, if we're not allowed to, to pursue a transformative agenda, even if the majority of us support that and support it to the point where we're willing to go out in the absolute, you know, pissing rain every day and try and campaign for it, then we do not live in a functioning democracy. So this needs to be the beginning of that wider discussion. Right. Well, thank you for coming on and doing the newspapers and talking about that issue. Um, and I'll, I'll just, I'm going to move on to another John. I'll get, I'm going to come back to, to our uh, John Dunn uh, in a bit, but I thought I'd speak to um, John Rogers in Brighton. Um, are you there, John? Yes, hello, Crispin. Now, John, oh, you've had your hair cut since I last spoke to you. Uh, I have, yes. Yeah, I, I'm noticing this. Um, what, what, um, what I what I noticed we, we spoke last time on here about his earlier email so it, I just wanted to catch up with you how do you feel about his latest one well um it got me reading the rule book and um I think it's really I think what we need is a reformation in our attitude to the Labour Party rule book because the rule book does not say what your regional official says that it says it does not say what your regional director says that it says. It does not say what the general secretary says that it says. It says what it actually says. Um, and if you look at the power that he says he's using, um, he's quite right that the NEC can delegate to him any of the NEC's powers. But there's a clause. It's on um, people have their rule books to hand. Um, and, you know, you really should. It's on page seven in chapter one. I think it's clause eight um, part, hang on, bear with me. I think it's three E, but it's on page seven. There's a clause about ensuring that party meetings and events should be conducted in a friendly and orderly manner to maximize participation, blah, 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 no discrimination. And it says the NEC shall from time to time issue guidance and instructions on the conduct of meetings. So you see, the rule book says guidance and instructions. It uses those two different words. Now, if you get issued with an instruction, that is something you have to do. If you don't follow an instruction, that's clearly naughty. But if you're given guidance, that's something that as a chair of a PLP, I should take into account in making any rulings that I make. 
and I will take it into account to the extent that it ever makes any sense, which up to now it hasn't made an awful lot of sense because the, like we talked about last time, his guidance suggested we couldn't debate any motions of solidarity with anyone. Well, that's just nonsensical. So I'm not taking that in that. If, if that's what he means, I'm not doing it because that's what he said. Um, but I think CLPs need to just stand up for our right to interpret our own rule book. Um, and, and that's why I refer to it as a reformation. You see, I think we, we want to, he, he issues these papal bulls, uh, if you like, from on high, telling us what we can do. Well, no, we can, we can relate directly to the received word of the rule book and, um, and, and use that and, and stand on that. Um, and that's what, that's what we should be doing. Um, certainly what we're doing in Brighton Pavilion and what we've experienced as a result is what you might call administrative sabotage because our secretaries had their access to various computer systems removed which is dramatic inconvenience I don't know how many other people have have experienced something like that we've not yet experienced anyone being suspended over this and I've replied to uh, the general secretary again and I'll I'll pop the link in the chat when I finish nattering um, so people can see what I said. But uh, I don't know why we haven't had the more draconian action taken against us that others have. I'd hypothesised it's because we don't have a Labour MP. We're not a target seat to win, I'm afraid, in Brighton Pavilion. Um, and, uh, and that may be why we're not on their radar for that sort of action. But I think the most important thing, the point I really want to make is the rule book says what it says and if and he doesn't quote it in detail so we can it won't prevent people being suspended or disciplined just because the rule book says that what we're doing isn't wrong but I think it's a, a good basis on which to fight on the question of the election of the general secretary the rule book actually does say the general secretary should be elected there's, there's, there's a section of the rule book headed election of the general secretary. It's just that at the moment, the rule book says the general secretary is elected by conference on the recommendation of the NEC. So, I mean, I think it's a good debate to open up. Should there be a wider participation in the election of the general secretary? Should it be by the electoral college that elects the leader, for example? Yeah. Or not. But also, we need to be prepared for the fact that what, this general secretary has never been elected to his post and there will be a party conference at which he has to be elected. And our delegates from our CLPs, those that haven't been suspended, will have to vote either for or against confirming him in his position. Right. And as part of the campaign around how should the general secretary be elected in future, there's a debate to be had about do we confirm this general secretary in post? Well, right, so he hasn't been confirmed yet because we haven't had a conference. So, no. yeah. Oh, right, well, it, would that be Brighton, wouldn't it, next one? Uh, I would hope so because it's easily the best place to have a conference. <laughs> All right. Th thanks, John. I'm going to move, uh, move on to Jill in Scarborough. Um, are you there, Jill? Oh, yeah. Can you hear Good me? See you. Um, now, you... You've been given that guidance by um, the General Secretary, but it seems that you actually passed a, a motion asking for the whip to be restored to Jeremy Corbyn. Is that is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So can, can you tell, tell us what when that was and what the response was of the CLP and have you had um, any feedback? Well, we've had, I mean, you're very fortunate if you actually had anything, even if it's just a sort of out of office reply from anyone, because we haven't had the courtesy of that from any of the people we've written to and I think that is that is actually an issue isn't it because apart from gross discourtesy it's it's uh, you know just a horrible thing to do to members when you know we've got a lot of trouble to communicate we don't get any response whatsoever so to me that's that's a thing you know um we had a meeting on Friday evening um and I put a little note on Twitter yesterday and it went kind of wild um, and it was it, again it was a very polite resolution and it was only it doesn't mention the PLP except to ask that Jeremy Corbyn be reinstated to, to the to the Parliamentary Labour Party um, so it doesn't mention any of the things we're not supposed to talk about and we couldn't see any problem with it but we had um, we had an email from regional office 
last Monday um, from our usual contact, who was actually a very junior member of the staff at the regional office, telling us that, um, I won't read it out to you, but I haven't got it to hand, but it just basically said this was not competent business, which seems to be the phrase of the moment, doesn't it? Um, but they didn't give any explanation or any quote any rules out of the rule book and to me that's another another long-standing issue about this is that they are not actually telling us what the basis they send emails that don't really make sense like the one you just quoted from David Evans um, and we're not told that the the basis of the decision really apart from because I say so because I can and to me, that's not that's not good enough. I'm very interested in what um, John from Brighton has just said. Um, our CLP secretary is a very assiduous searcher of the rule book, and he's been looking for things. But we, we came to the conclusion that there was nothing, and I've, I've picked this again off social media, that there's no problem about talking about the content of something. Oh, sorry, they've, they've got no right to say there's nothing in the rule book about dictating the content of a meeting. They can offer guidance about the, which I think is what John was saying, they can offer guidance about the, um, the, the format of a meeting or how to, the process, but not the content. All right, okay, yeah. That's I think that's right. I mean, I've picked that up from others. I've been doing a lot of searching um, online. Ahead as, of as John said, there's the, 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 the thing about suspension, that, that they can come with that um, anytime, mm. anyway, so. It's, and he said it's not to do with the rule book. It's just it, it's uh, the suspension yeah. something different to that. So it's yeah. quite a, a, a strange thing. But it's great that you you put that motion through. And I and when I saw that on Twitter, I, I was it, it, it inspired me to to get you to come on and, and speak about it. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, Jamie in uh, Cheshire in Weaver Vale, nearer to Liverpool than Manchester, apparently. Is that is that right, Jamie? That's that's like it, uh, Chris. But yeah. Uh, um, now you were you were in a meeting this week, um, and you spoke in a meeting, and, and you what what happened? Well, firstly, good morning, Chris, and uh, good morning, comrades. Yeah, I, I was at my CLP on Friday, uh, and I, I I'm not going to allow people to stop me speaking up. I don't care where that is, whether it's in the workplace, whatever that may be, I'm going to speak up when I when I need to speak up. So I spoke up and it was about the treatment to Jeremy. Uh, I, I was being disgracefully treated. So, uh, and, and especially, you know, four years late, later, he's still being hounded. So I had to, I had to say something. If you don't say, if you don't say nothing, if you keep your mouth, you, you, you're doing, you're doing, you're complicit in just joining in in what they're doing. So I, I, I'm not going to accept that. And you can throw me out the party all you want, because as far as I'm concerned, I'm one of the campaigners in, in my area that my MP needs. I'm more important to him than than, than, than anything. So so I, I, I was actually going to leave the party. I remained a member because people like Jeremy and uh, John and Rebecca Long-Bailey and obviously me, me comrades in Unite, uh, they urged me to stay and fight, and, and, and that I will. Uh, but I'm certainly not staying and being silent. And I'm wondering if I'll get a letter off David Evans after uh, the CLP meeting. But I bet it won't be the response to the one I sent in June asking for me personal information when I was an NEC member in them leaked documents with, when I put an SAR in, subject access request. I know that's not coming. Uh, but so it's uh, important that you were an NEC member. Um, so, so you, I mean, that's quite a, a big story if you were suspended i mean it's quite a perhaps that's why they won't do it i don't know uh you know maybe that's the noise i don't know i mean i, I as, as i said i'll always stand up and speak out but what but i need to say this because when i was when i was on the nec i wrote to ian mcnichol you'll all remember the time when owen smith called jeremy corbyn a lunatic i wrote to the whole of the nec including every nec member and I, and I asked that uh, Owen Smith make an apology for using language. I myself have lost personal friends through suicide uh, and, and I have friends who suffer with mental health. And I didn't like the tip, the language lunatic. Ian McNichol responded, but uh, it, it's just colourful language. Uh, 
and I was like, no, no, no that's it. And then I got another uh, another call off Ian McNichol to say, uh, Owen Smith wants to speak to you and, and uh, have a chat about what he said. I said, I don't want Owen Smith to call me. I want him to make a public apology. That's that's all I'm asking for. So, uh, as I said, I'm not going to stand sit aside and, and not speak up at, at, at these event, at the, uh, our CLPs. Never going to happen. I'm a trade unionist and I'll defend people till uh, who I think are being unjust. Don't I don't use I, I don't use uh, aggressive language. I don't use foul language. But uh, but but I'm not going to sit there and watch people be uh, uh, accused. And by the way. Uh, all of our CLP agreed, so uh, it shows where where people are at this time. I mean that that is a problem, isn't it? That that there's lots of members who don't want to be silenced and want to speak, um, but they put this thing in to stop chairs and secretaries. So people who are volunteers for that CLP are put under pressure from the top not to allow discussion, and then pe members say, "Can we just talk about this?" And they say, "No, it's." It's putting them in an impossible situation. I mean, it's it's, it's ridiculous. Um, look, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on, Jamie, to someone who's actually been suspended um, for um, some of the things that they've written. I think I, or, or said. I, I don't want to. I don't want to um, get them into any trouble by speaking too much about it. But uh, we're going back to we're going back to John Dunn again here, who's who obviously has done the newspapers here. But I saw John that. You've been suspended this week. Um, can you tell us how you feel about that? Uh, well, I'm, uh, it's not upsetting me because life is carrying on as normal for me. But I'm angry because I was apparently suspended. We, we had our constituency uh, party Zoom meeting and mysteriously in mid-speech, my uh, Zoom wasn't switched off where I was muted and blanked out. So I couldn't speak. And when I protested, uh, I was and I was then accused of bullying and thrown out of the meeting. So I made a complaint about that to the NEC and then I got a suspension letter back with 22 points that I've got. To, they said within a week of the, within seven days of the date of this email, but they sent that email to me at 19 minutes to 11 at night, so it really six days to answer 22 points. And then I've since had another 12 points added because, you know, I can't talk about it. and only apparently talk about it to the Samaritans. Uh, and I'm on speed dial with them, the number of uh, references I've been, at the time I've been referred to them. But now, uh, because, I, I don't stay quiet, and uh, the only outlet I've got is, is social media. They now want me, and this is where I could do with some help from comrades. I use, when somebody sent me a message of solidarity, I said, it'll take more than a few jumped up human turds to frighten me. And now they want to know who I meant by human turds, but they've not put any upper limit on it. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm stuck and I'm appealing for help on this. Do I include the 172 coup members of the PLP? Do I include the people who sabotage the election? How far do I go? So I'm struggling. I've only got four days left to do it now. But the, the tragedy is, and what does frustrate me, and it's this catch-22, I'm not supposed to discuss it. It's a disciplinary offence to discuss it with anybody. A number of comrades from that constituency meeting have contacted me offering to be witnesses in my defense. The trouble is, if I reply to them, that's an offense. And if they actually know that I've been suspended, they're as guilty as that. So they've wrapped us up in this straight jacket of, you can't talk to anybody, you can't discuss this. Whereas they can go and brief the media uh, on, on everything. And I'm really angry. I've been a member for 49 years. I was suspended for, for collaring Owen Smith when he tried to hijack our, our uh, all grief campaign. I was suspended then, never told why. I was let back in, but I was told unofficially I got to keep my head down. Now, when you've got a head this size, it's a little bit difficult to do. And I'm not the sort 
that does that, but I've been a Claycross councillor surcharged for carrying out party policy. I was sacked from a job for time off because I took time off legitimately for council duties. And now I find the Labour Party don't want me. And, uh, you know, I knocked a, a campaign at the last election in four different constituencies. I, I, I trundled on election day through all that pouring rain in North East Derbyshire for the excellent crispies. And now I'm not wanted. Uh, and I'm, well, I'm supposed to be not wanted quietly. Well, anybody who knows me knows, you know, I don't do things quietly. So I'm fighting back. Uh, I, I don't even know who's made this complaint, but as far as I'm concerned, the human turds is actually putting it mildly. I could have used a lot more pit language about these people and might well do in future. If anybody wants to see it, just read the post that I, the only outlet I've got is social media. Well, John, John, you can come on again next week if you want to, whether you're suspended or, or what, whoever the turds are, you're, you're, um, you're fine. Yeah. Okay. So they always float to the surface, don't they? <laughs> All right, John. Uh, now, I'm going to move on to um, Amar. Uh, Amar, yeah, there you are, Amar. Right. Um, good to see you. Um, okay. Can you hear me all right? I can. Uh, now, you, you've written uh, the definitive thesis on the EHRC report. Um, and I, I read, I, I have to say, I've read most of it. Um, I can't say I've read every single word. Um, but I, I, I was really impressed by the thoroughness of your research um, and your unpicking every, every bit of it. Um, now, what I wrote to the EHRC was this, this email asking them um, if they were happy with their report being used um, in this email by the General Secretary to um, stop... Uh, to take precedence over our rights at this time, that, that we should not speak about things uh, because of what's happened with the EHRC report effectively. What, is, is there any basis in the EHRC report that we have to all be silent about everything? Well, uh, Chris, just before I begin, I'd just like to do a very quick disclaimer that what I'm going to say is not uh, legal advice. It's just my personal perspective, having thoroughly considered the report, as you have said. And I've gone into some of these issues um, in the in the article itself. But the issue is really, I mean, it depends how you look at the report. I mean, I'd say from the outset that there's, there is a general problem of interpreting the EHRC report literally. If it were to be interpreted literally, then, you know, Jeremy Corbyn would never have been suspended because his comments were explicitly permitted by the EHRC report about the scale of anti-Semitism uh, in the party. He wouldn't have also been suspended by David Evans, uh, you know who, uh, given that the General Secretary's office is classed as being part of the party's political organs who shouldn't be involved in disciplinary issues. We also wouldn't have had Angela Rayner uh, promising to personally suspend thousands and thousands of members if necessary according to her view um, because that would also constitute political interference according to the EHRC report so the one point that I've made is that the, what the EHRC report says is really neither here nor there we should know what it says and we should analyze that but we should also not sort of remove it from the political context um, so let's look at what Evan said I mean you 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 uh, read it right at the beginning uh, Crispin which is he said our responsibility to double down on anything that may cause members to continue to feel unwelcome and unsafe must take precedence over our rights at this time. Now, you know, aside from being a barefaced example, I've said of saying the quiet part out loud, it's also unclear, you know, to what rights Evans is referring. Is he talking about our human rights under the European Convention on Human Rights? Is he talking about our rights as, uh, as Labour Party members? But he appears to be saying, in what I say is a bizarre contradiction um, that he has to order the suppression of lawful freedom of expression because in his view it's legally necessary well that's frankly unconvincing and what it ultimately boils down to which i don't think many people have yet understood but which this seems to be the way it's playing out is that um it goes down to the reason underpinning why the party was said to have committed unlawful harassment right it wasn't because necessarily of what ken livingstone 
or Pam Bromley said. It was because the party was said to be responsible for what they said uh, and the environment that it created. Um, and the reason why that was is because they were said to have not taken swift enough or strong enough action against its own office holders, its agents, those two individuals. Um, and so when they made those comments, they were essentially sort of representing the party as part of their authorised functions. So what that means is whenever party office holders like CLP chairs or secretaries are said to be, quote, creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment, then if the party doesn't take swift enough action against them, according to that logic, it's unlawful. That's why we've seen CLP chairs across the country and secretaries like Louise Regan in Nottingham East. We saw Naomi Wimborne Idrisi, who herself is Jewish, being uh, swiftly suspended. That's from what it seems, um, is the party essentially doing that? So they can essentially say that they haven't committed unlawful harassment because those people who've done that, those actions, who've created that environment in their CLPs, they aren't doing that as part of their authorised function. Now, in my view, that's a very cynical way, to say it lightly, of um, interpreting what the report says. Actually, I would also, I'd go further than that. I would say it's a very malicious way of interpreting what the report um, has says. So what David Evans is doing, he is he is taking what seems to be very heavy handed preemptive action, right, to prevent people feeling, in his view, unwelcome and unsafe, which, you know, it, in itself is not what the report is talking about. It talks about creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment. Those are the words in the uh, those are the statute. That's the statutory defini definition of harassment. Those are very, very strong words. Right. You can't just say, well, because a meeting was slightly, you know, um, controversial and heated and the, the debate got a bit heavy that it creates that environment. No, all those words are very, very strong. They're not synonyms. They have individual meanings. So to claim that he's taking that action in order to prevent that sort of environment being created is completely, in my view, disingenuous. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just completely absurd. I don't think he's basing it at all, really, on what the EHRC report is saying. He's, he's taking what the EHRC report has said, and then he's just running with it. You know, he's, he's, he's had an inch, he's taking a mile. Um, and, yeah, there doesn't seem to be any lawful reason for why he's doing that. It just and seems what, to be he's using the report maliciously. And, 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 and you've, you've found lots of um, sort of weaknesses, well, just weaknesses in the EHRC report um, uh, in, in that it's kind of, you know, for example, it doesn't take into account the leaked report at all. It mm. says we're not going to take that into account. Um, but you say in law, you should take account of everything that is relevant to a particular case. Is that it? Or, or investigation? I mean, well, should they, they have, considered they not have yes. taken into account the leaked report, for example. They say that they considered the leaked report, but the issue is not necessarily the, the leaked report itself. Obviously, that's an 850 page document. But within the leaked report, it only has extracts of all of those emails and WhatsApp messages. There's thousands of emails, WhatsApp messages. That's all of the underlying evidence of the leaked report, which they have never taken into account. And of course, it's not in the public domain because that didn't get leaked. Only the leaked report itself got leaked, but not the sort of additional masses of information. Um, and I say that all of that is so relevant because it's all related. Firstly, it was all compiled specifically for the EHRC. Right? The EHRC acknowledges that, and so does the Labour Party in the leaked report. It was, it was compiled for the yeah. EHRC. Um, and it's specifically relating to the issue that the EHRC report is talking about. So there's a very um, uh, clear a legal precedent on this, which is that if, if um, evidence exists that is uh, pertinent to sort of a report or pertinent to investigation or to a decision made by a decision maker, then if it's, if it's so obviously material, which I say it is, that not taking it into account would be irrational, then that's unlawful. And I say, given how um, extensive that evidence is, given that it was compiled specifically for the EHRC, given that it was directly related to the party's handling of complaints about anti-Semitism, it was obviously material to the investigation. So their failure to take it into account was irrational and hence unlawful. But there are so many other problems, Crispin. I can't really go into them all uh, in, in this time frame. But I mean, there are issues related, for example, to their interpretation of the European Convention on Human Rights. Just a very quick example. They, uh, you know, the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 10, Freedom of Expression, 
does have some limits on what it offers. You know, it can't protect, you know, hate speech or incitement to violence and all that kind of stuff. But that isn't what Ken Livingstone and Pam Bromley did. Um, they've also cited cases to justify their point for why Article 10 freedom of expression shouldn't apply. But those cases relate to, you know, really brazen, outright anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial, really abhorrent views, which are completely, it's like it's preposterous to even compare that to what Ken Livingstone and Pam Bromley did, even if you don't agree with what they said. It's just absurd to make that comparison. So, uh, and they've also haven't addressed the point that politicians and also the media and people who comment on politics like ourselves enjoy enhanced protection under Article 10. Uh, because obviously it would create a terrible legal precedent if people who are involved in politics weren't allowed to speak freely on a number of issues. So they haven't even addressed that particular point. Why haven't they addressed why Pam Bromley and Ken Livingstone, as politicians at that time, uh, didn't enjoy that enhanced protection? So there are so many um, uh, issues, Crispin, but I say that all of those problems are so great uh, that there was no legal basis, actually, on which to make any findings of unlawful indirect discrimination or harassment. And I've detailed all of that uh, in that yeah. article, I, I recommend anyone to read it. But the but the other conclusion that you made was that it was um, a surprise that the Labour Party, in some way, didn't take, didn't challenge the EHRC report because of its uh, not having taken into account all these things that it should have, and the inconsistencies and the lack of um, just the, the lack the the. The, the the thing about the the agenda of the the EHRC report. What 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 do you think? Why do you think the EHRC report wasn't challenged by the Labour Party? Well, I think that's a very important point, Crispin. I think it will be of interest because I don't think many party members have really picked up on this. But it'll be of massive interest to party members. Why didn't the party leadership, David Evans and uh, Keir Starmer and Angela Rayner, engage in any sort of challenge to, towards this report? There's something called a maxwellization process, which uh, before a sort of significant report like this happened, it will ha happen with a Chilcot report, for example. Those named in the report or those who are concerned with its contents have the opportunity to see it in advance in draft form and to challenge it. Right. So it seems to me that the party, I don't know whether they did or they didn't, but it seems to me that for political reasons, because it seems they wanted to damage the previous leadership as much as possible, didn't bother to challenge any of these legal flaws in the report, which, as, as I say, were extensive. Why didn't they do that? And not only that, um, when the report was published and we finally got to see exactly what it said, you know, the entire public, they had six weeks, six further weeks to challenge it uh, legally through a judicial, uh, sorry, through an appeal process. That six weeks has now expired. But why didn't they do that? Well, it seems to me they've just tried to maximise as much as possible uh, the damage against Jeremy Corbyn, the previous leadership. And obviously they want to use it as a stick to beat not only him with, but all of us, everyone who was sort of um, in his movement and who supported him at that time. So that's a, a very interesting thing that we have to, uh, I think that they don't deserve condemnation for actually. And we should be aware that they haven't done that and that they've, they've allowed these um, a findings of unlawful harassment and indirect discrimination to go against the party without any challenge. Thank you. I, I find it uncomfortable even talking about that report because I've been, it, I think it says you're not supposed to talk about it. There's no, you, you can't speak about it in meetings. So um, I'm sort of <laughs> feeling I'm about to be suspended or something. I don't know. Um, uh, thank you very much for coming on, Emma. Um, I'm going to move me. to um, Harrow to Pamela, um, who is there. Pamela, are you there? Hi, Crispin, I am. Good are to you? see everybody. Hello? Oh, good. You, you stood to be General Secretary. Um, so we could, we, why don't we just call it the, the, the you're the General Secretary. Why don't we just name you the General Secretary and we'll talk to you about it. Um, so uh, what, what's your, what do you think about what you've heard so far in the show? So it's interesting. What I was going to say completely changed my mind, actually. And what struck me from listening today is that we've got a grassroots movement, an uprising from members who are saying no more. We're not going to take this anymore. And from hearing particularly you, Crispin, I have to give you credit because you're one of the few people who's been brave enough to really allow freedom of speech throughout the last year. So well done you. I really do think you've been excellent. 
Um, and what we've got are individuals, you know, hearing John Rogers, for example, I've heard him a few times speak now, and he represents all that is fantastic about the Labour Party. There are many others, just to use him, who are saying this is not right. And the problem we've had, I think, over the last year, and by the way, the revelations in the Labour leaked report were not revelations, they were confirmation of what we knew was going on. It wasn't a surprise to me when I read that report, because I have lived that experience for the last five years. Prior to Jeremy Corbyn, I was viewed in Harrow as a kind of rather eccentric socialist, you know, there weren't many of us about, and I was tolerated. I was a middle-aged mum who worked for a charity. After Jeremy, when we started mobilising people, when we saw how popular Jeremy and the policies were, I became a dangerous person that had to be suspended in 2016, not over anti-Semitism, but just fabricated things from some of my fellow Labour members. And what's happening now is that we should be seeing from all the left organisations a real coming together and being bold and I don't see that so when I stood when I applied to be the general secretary I had no illusions that Keir Starmer would appoint me as the general secretary I think I would have done a much better job because I've worked in these kind of procedures you know fairness and everything all my life uh, but I had no illusions but what I did was to raise the issue about wider participation in the election of a general secretary now that was fine then but since then, we've had declarations of war with the former most popular leader of the party being suspended and now having the whip taken away. So I don't think discussions about wider participation of the General Secretary at some future date is the way to go now. And if you think about all the brave people, those people going to court of whom we're going to hear soon, and I know how stressful that is going through a court procedure and how potentially expensive it can be. These are brave individuals. Crispin is brave. As he said, he's worried about what people are going to say on the show. Uh, John and Jamie and all those other in, you know, CLP chairs, secretaries who are saying, no, we are not going to put up with this because it is not right. And as Amir has said you know fantastic that he spent all this time his own time analyzing the report at risk to him presumably because he could be suspended for speaking out um all these people are doing it individually and it's not good enough we need some support we need to know that when members are going to be targeted they're going to be supported in challenging and whether that's through the unions or through the left organizations speaking out more strongly you know why is it that people have to have a vote or a, a petition to try to get momentum to uh, agree that there should be motions of no confidence in Starmer. That should be absolute when given what has happened. And as Amir said, the uh, freedom of speech is a fundamental aspect of UK law. Absolutely. It can be curtailed. It can be but only where that's prescribed by law, by so for things like um, hate speech, for example. And it is by law, it is not by the Labour Party. So if somebody is guilty of one offence, that doesn't mean that they can be prevented from all further rights. Again, it's the Labour Party abusing their power and it's got to stop. So we're at a crisis, a crisis at this moment. And are we mm -hmm. going to allow the general secretary who hasn't even been elected to the position yet, he is an acting general secretary, are we going to allow the next thing to be that the conference will be banned, that members no longer have the right to vote in the general secretary because they've decided that it's going to be uncomfortable? And who exactly is being made uncomfortable at our CLP meetings? Because I can tell you, I've had so many Jewish members say to me they are now so worried because they're on the left of the party that they are going to be suspended. They feel frightened, they feel worried to speak out. And then I'll just finish by saying, well, this worry about how people feel in CLP meetings and others is not extended to all members. I've been aware of really horrendous transphobic comments by somebody quite senior with in holding positions of authority in the, in the party. I've reported that nothing has been done 
I've also for years myself experienced it, but witnessed other women suffering harassment. And that's been reported again and again and again. Nothing has happened. So is this really about how members feel going to CLP meetings? Or is it about an abuse of power to stop your critics from speaking out? And it's quite clearly an abuse of power to stop your critics challenging you. And this has no place in the Labour Party. So for me, the people who are bringing the party into disrepute are the people who are trying to erode the basic principles of the Labour Party and freedom of speech. So please, we need the left group step up and follow what the members are doing, support us in those really difficult things that we're doing to speak out and challenge what's going on. You know, I spend every day looking in my inbox now for the, for the email that's coming, and I'm sure we're all doing that, and it's not right, and we've got to speak out. So well done to you, Crispin, and all the other individuals here that do that on a daily basis and challenge things. Thank you, Pamela. I, I think we should collaborate more. There's got to be more collaboration. There's too many different groups on the left or whatever saying... They're, they're fighting this and you know if we all work together we do much better I, I think um i want to speak now on an upbeat note um to end the discussion a very upbeat note indeed <laughs> not for not for david evans though um this is uh, i'm going to speak to angie who is uh part who's, who's part of one of seven people is that right angie who are um <laughs> taking the labor party to court uh do you want to tell us more angie because i'm going to say the wrong thing and get myself in trouble <laughs> Yes, you have to be very careful what you say these days. Um, so I just want to introduce myself. I'm the treasurer of Jewish Voice for Labour. Uh, and I'm also from Nottingham ECLP. So I'd like to have a shout out to our suspended chair, uh, Louise Regan, as uh, who was on last week, and also Naomi Wimborne Adrissi, and to all those who've been wrongfully uh, suspended or um, disciplined uh, by the Labour Party. So somebody mentioned earlier, how do we hold these people to account? And um, sadly, I think a group have come to the conclusion that the only way is by legal means. Um, and the good news for that is that our group, Labour Activists for Justice, I'll put a, a link to our, our crowd justice site in, in a bit, um, are taking David Evans and the Labour Party to court with the aim of um, improving the situation for all Labour Party members. That, that's our aim. We don't want to, to, to um, just sort out these cases. We want it to be for all. Um, I don't have to tell this audience how much some people, many people, suffer when they get their letter from the Labour Party telling them that they're being investigated, particularly for anti-Semitism. Um, we have heard heard some very heartbreaking stories of people uh, who, who have had that accusation made and the Labour Party obviously know this because in their letters as probably you all know uh, they put in where you can get support for your mental health and well-being including the the Samaritans and as um other people have mentioned, John Dunn mentioned earlier, um, the aspect of confidentiality. You're not allowed to share um, what, what said. You can only go to the Samaritans um, and your GP, apparently. Uh, you can't share that information. So we're a group of, I, I'm not part of the group, I'm from JVL who is supporting the group, but Labour Activists for Justice are a group of seven Labour Party activists. It's taken us six months and many, many lawyers' letters to the Labour Party uh, to get us to this point of filing for the High Court, um, which has been ample time for the Labour Party to have responded. Very recently, as, as we know, and as we heard from Amar just now, um, the EHRC report, which we can, I think, agree um, is a flawed report, but we can agree that one of the things that the EHRC pointed out was that the disciplinary processes of the Labour Party are not fit for purpose. And as we know, Starmer and Evan have come out very, very publicly 
and have said they would implement all its recommendations. And they've said that it will be fully implemented for all Jewish members, that's including those of us and some and lots of Jewish members who have been um, suspended for alleged anti-Semitism or related offences. So you would think that they would take the very first opportunity to set things right, having had our lawyers' letters, and they would address our concerns about the unfair processes being um, used. They would take their time and to implement perhaps a new system of discipline, and um, they would stop these cases that are being taken under a very unfair system. And our lawyers very helpfully wrote to them to suggest that that's what they should do. And interestingly enough, their reply was that apparently the EHRC report doesn't apply to these cases. I mean, that's a very strange thing for them to say. And it's astonishing because you think, well, if it doesn't apply to these cases, who does it? actually apply to um, to get fair uh, processes. So now we've actually filed the court papers and we can finally be be named and um, I'll put a link to the crowd justice site which gives you the updates of who everybody is um, and I think it should be noticed of, of these seven um, people in in the group four of them are Jewish and three of them are in their 80s um, and what's very common is that they're lifelong anti-racists, they're activists, they're socialists and they're Palestine supporters. So the things that we're sort of challenging on really are why are all the complainants anonymous? Um, we don't know who it is who's complained about us. Are they do they have any other reasons for complaining? Are they making lots and lots of complaints against many, many different people? Um, and the other uh, factor is that they're using an unpublished code of conduct on anti-Semitism to base their allegations on, but they're not sending out this code of conduct to tell the people accused under the code of conduct what it is that they're being uh, accused, what, what that's based on. Um, so they won't publish it and they won't uh, send it out. And I, I have to say that again from, from uh, many of your speakers uh, today, that, that there's no um, coincidence that on our crowd justice site, we've used a picture from the book cover of Kafka's The Trial, because very often people are really uh, uncertain of what is, what is going on there. And I'd just like to finish, if I may, with a quote from one of the group, who may also be on this course, she might be somewhere in, in the participants here, um, who is Diana Neslin, who's an 81 year old Orthodox Jew. And she has said, throughout its history, the labor movement has fought for the rights of workers, including the right to a fair and just disciplinary process. If any employer try to impose the party's process on their employees today, the labour movement and the unions would be up in arms. It is a disgrace that needs to be fixed. So hopefully our case, um, we will win our case, we'll get justice for all our, our members um, and we will, I will put the link to our crowd justice site. Obviously it's a costly business taking um, people to court um, and it will reach six figures some at some point. So if anybody hasn't already donated, then please do consider donating as well that's it thank you oh thank you thank you angie um good to hear and uh, lots of applause i'm seeing and now um i know i know what's going to happen now um well we've, we've come to the end of this discussion um in the absence of the general secretary um i think what i've picked up from it is that there is a lot of people out there who are angry and fighting in different ways there's lots of legal advice out there there's lots of opinions, there's the rule book, there's experts like John Rogers on the rule book. We've got um, Amar, um, who's, you've got to read his, his article, his thesis um, on this. 
Um, and there's a law, there's a court case. There's a lot going on. I mean, there's a lot to get involved in just before Christmas. It's not just about um, presents and all that kind of stuff. Shakespeare, I can understand German and French. I can understand some things need a hammer, some things need a monkey wrench. I can understand you mean it's cool when you say it's sick. But I can't understand. No, I can't understand. No, I can't understand why anyone in charge is a dick. Well, I can understand money swears and patriarchy sticks. And I can understand an iceberg quotes and Moriarty sinks. I can understand they promise you a carrot and they hit you with a stick. But I can't understand. No, I can't understand. No, I can't understand what anyone in charge is a dick. this happen? I can't understand. Yeah, how does this happen? I can't understand how anyone in charge is a dick. Well, I can understand nuance, the Beauvoir and Camus. I can understand irony and recognise bullshit too. Like, we're gonna send the gunboats in to protect our fish. No, I can't understand No, I can't understand No, I can't understand How anyone in charge is a dick All together No, I can't understand No, I can't understand No, I can't understand What anyone in charge is a dick No, I can't understand What anyone in charge is a dick How's that happen?